Excuse me. Good morning. Morning. <laughs> you didn't eat at the table during worship, it's not because the food wasn't prepared. Amen. <clears throat> I want to thank our worship team for being so faithful week after week after week and being diligent to make it easy for us to worship, to being led of God in the selection of their songs, to being obedient as they worship before us and lead us into worship. Because, you know, standing up here and leading worship and looking at a lot of you can be an intimidating experience because a lot of you scowl. <laughs> and I know because I'm one of you. Um, I remember several people said the first time I came to this church, I left a marked impression. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have for me? <clears throat> but thank you guys very much. Steve and Angie, thank you. You guys will never really know until you stand before his throne how valuable, how invaluable what you guys do for this church is. Your leadership for this worship team and, and all of the different people that, that participate is, is just incredible. So thank you very much. We are wrapping up, we're coming close to wrapping up Fruit of a Life Led by the Spirit. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Galatians chapter 5. <coughs> um, Josh, would you go ahead and put the overhead up, the first one? These are just definitions that I've given to each of the, the fruits that we've covered thus far. This is just to kind of help you keep up with where we're at. You notice that it's getting kind of full up here. We've covered love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness. And today we're working on faithfulness. Now, faith is one of the big words in the church. There's a reason for that. Because without it, you cannot please God. <clears throat> and one of the fruits of a life sealed by God's Spirit, if God is living in you, these fruits will be exhibited in your life. Some degree or another, greater or lesser. Some of you are going to excel in these gifts that probably my fruit will forever be shriveled compared to yours. Remember, we are doing this increasingly not perfectly. Only Jesus was perfect. Okay? But we need to be doing this increasingly. Our goal is to become perfect. Understanding that before God we stand perfect with the imputed righteousness of Christ. But in this life, the process of sanctification, the process of being made holy, is being worked out day by day. Alright? So, if you have God's Spirit living inside of you, these things should start showing up sooner rather than later. So if you're uh, at Galatians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 16. <coughs> Paul writing, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. And he lists uh, a number of them. This is not an all-inclusive list. Humans are incredibly creative, and we invent new ones. 
Okay? This is kind of to be an example of the, the things that you should be aware of in your life. That if this is what you are exhibiting, this is not according to God. This is not somebody who has got spirit living inside of them. This is not what you should be doing. This is not what you should look like. These are not the characteristics that should mark your life. Okay? So you can look through that list. We're going to pick up down in verse 22. In direct contrast to these things, this is what our lives should exhibit. Okay? These are the characteristics that we should have abundant in our lives. These should mark us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Okay? So we see here a couple of things that I want to point out to you just off the bat so we're all on the same page. Whose fruit is this? The Spirit's fruit. Okay? It's not like you can just sit down one day and all of a sudden decide, I'm going to have faithfulness today. Or patience. Or kindness. Okay? This is not something that you can accomplish in and of your own. However, it is something that you are called to practice. Okay? God births it in you. you got to get out of his way so it can grow. Okay? All too often, we, we like go around and we put these little zip strips on the fruit so that what the vine is trying to nourish the fruit with, the fruit can't get and it won't grow. And a lot of us have raisins instead of grapes. We have a healthy crop of raisins growing, not growing, just sitting there. Okay? So, one, you understand it's God's spirit that has this fruit that is being birthed in you. If God's spirit is in you, these things will start coming out of you. Two, you have to make a conscious decision every day, every moment of every day, to not walk according to your flesh, but to walk according to the spirit that these fruits might grow and increase. Okay? Now trust me, it is every moment. Because sure as you go, Yahoo, I got that one, the next one's there. Okay? So every moment, increasingly, increasingly. So faithfulness. This is actually one of those that, uh, oh my goodness, my notes are out of order. But that's okay, because I don't ever follow in order anyway. This is one of those that the English word, the definition for this word, is actually very, very similar to the Greek. So this one, Miriam got right. All right? According to the dictionary, to be faithful is to have strict or be strict or thorough in the performance of a duty. True to one's word, promises, vows. Steady in allegiance or affection, loyal, constant, reliable, trusted or believed. Adhering or truth to fact, a standard or an original a standard or an original accurate and then, I don't know why, but it has obsolete, full of faith, believing. Hmm. You know, kind of great how we've advanced, huh? Now, in the Greek, the word is pistis. And this word is actually used, it's a, it's a very pointed definition off of a very general word. Now, I'm going to give you the general word so that we can arrive at the conclusion what Paul is talking about here. Because this word is the root of every time you see faith in the New Testament. Okay, now there's a couple of different variations on this word, but all of them are based off of this idea. So, <clears throat> generally to win over, to persuade, 
Firm persuasion, conviction, belief in the truth. Objectively, meaning that which is believed, doctrine, the received articles of faith. Specifically, in this context, the way that this word is used right here, it means good faith, faithfulness, or sincerity. Okay? Now, I read a lot of different things because I don't trust myself. Because I know I've got areas that I'm blind in. I've got areas that I've not been exposed in. I think this is why God puts in his word that in the counsel of many is wisdom. This is why we have a leadership team. Okay? Because I miss things. So I read a lot of other people. I, I write down what I think God has given me. And then I start looking at other people to see what they have to say about this. And one of the things that uh, we actually are, are getting in the library now. Uh, you can't get it yet. Too bad for you. But I have it. Um, Spiros Zadiades has written a word study on the Old and the New Testament. I love it because he's one of the few writers that actually puts things in context to the way that it was used according to them, not according to us. Okay, And that's significant because when Paul wrote this, he wasn't writing to us directly. He was only writing to us indirectly as God led him. He was writing to the people in the churches of Galatia. And he used his words very specifically to what they were dealing, but he was being influenced by God's Spirit so that the words that he gave them would be equally applicable to us. All right? So, faithfulness. Here's the definition that we're going to work from. Would you go ahead and put that up, Josh? The characteristic of a person who is reliable, sincere. Now, that is a combination of William Barclay's uh, definition of the word and Spiro Zariati's. I've combined the two of them because they said it a lot better than I could. All right? So, the characteristic of a person who is reliable and sincere. Now, the reason I started off with the general word usage is because what are you reliable and sincere about? What you believe. What you believe. Now, as Christians, this marks out something unique and significant for us because there are people in the world that have faithfulness. But their faithfulness isn't like ours. And our faithfulness should not look like theirs. Why? Because our faithfulness is based on a God who gives meaning to the word faithful. Whereas their faithfulness is simply something that they try and attain through their own strength out of devotion or loyalty to something that is important in their lives. Now ours is too, but ours is to God. Theirs is to whatever little g God they have in their life. Because everybody serves a God. Even the atheists who don't think they serve any God, don't believe there is any God. Even the agnostics who don't want to be troubled with it. They're serving a God. The atheists, it's their own intellect. And I'm sorry, I've known some very intelligent people. But nobody has all the answers. And nobody can figure it out on their own. Nobody. So, why is our faithfulness different? Because we have a God who defines what faith is. So let's take a, couple, uh, a look at a couple of passages that I want to uh, share with you. This particular word is used in three other passages in the New Testament. <laughs> The first one is Matthew 23, 23. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. He says, Woe to you. Don't worry about turning there. If you guys want my notes, I'll give you a copy after service. I'm going to jump to a lot of scriptures. Okay? I'd rather you kept your attention on what I'm saying. Look at it afterwards. If you find a problem, something to be concerned with, please come and talk to me. But, but keep up with me here because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill 
and come in and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Romans 3.3 3. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify, faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? For those of you that didn't pick that up, this is the same word usage here, and it's from the same author. So the faithfulness that he is telling us should be exhibited in our lives is the same faithfulness that he's using right here to describe God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? 1 Timothy chapter 1. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. That same context there. Having faith, same word. That faithfulness. Holding fast to it. If you don't hold fast to it, what happens? Your faith is shipwrecked. You understand that we are engaged in battle? Every moment from here to God take us home, we are engaged in constant, unceasing, unremitting warfare. And we have three enemies. We have the devil, that liar and the father of all liars, who wants nothing but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Okay? You think he's letting you have it easy? That's because he's got you where he wants you. If you don't see the enemy at work in your life, it's because you're not looking. Alright? Now whether... It, be because he makes things rough or because he makes things easy. You understand that? A lot of times, the enemy comes against us in such a way that lulls us into a false sense of security and confidence. Everything's going great. And we don't even understand how far we are removed from the heart of God. We've grown comfortable complacent in our faith, in our walk. Okay? So we have the devil who is opposed to us. We have this world, this world system, the culture that is around us that works very hard to oppose God and to insinuate things in our mind and our lives that are not godly. We are cautioned to always be on our guard Take a look around. Watch the news. You want a challenge? Watch the news and see the things that they say are wrong and the things that they indicate are right and then look at it in light of God's word and see what he says. Ooh. Wow. You'll get an entirely different view of the news. You think the news is depressing now? Look at it in light of God's word. Thank God, I already know the end of the story, and I know who holds me through all the garbage that's happening in this world and all the garbage that is yet to come. Thank God for that. Now, I, I don't know about you guys, I don't watch the news. I read it because I can go, yeah, nope, don't like it. Nope, don't want it. Garbage. But I always read it with an eye toward certain things. I always read the news with an eye toward the end. And the end is not based in the United States of America. That's right. The end is based Israel. And that's where we need to be paying attention to what's going on. Okay? So the world and this world system that is set up and opposed and hostile to God. And then the third enemy, uh, yep, yourself, me. And a lot of times I'm my worst enemy. A lot of times the enemy doesn't, the devil doesn't need to come against me. 
I shipwrecked myself. Man, enemy's got his hands full elsewhere. I take care of it all on my own. But we are engaged in constant, unceasing warfare against these three things. But God has prepared us to wage war. To fight the good fight. He has given us armor and armament. He has given us mighty weapons for the tearing down of strongholds. And the best thing of all, he fights on our behalf. It's great. You suit up, you get on the battle lines, and you watch him wipe out the enemy. I like that army. Okay? Okay? You need to keep in mind that what God has given us, the gates of hell will not prevail against. Do you understand what that means? It means that the enemy is on the defensive, not us. We have got to get out of this defensive, cowering posture and step forward to being the mighty men and women of God that he has called us to be. What can the enemy do to you? You're not his. You're not the world's. You're not even your own. You have been bought with a price. You belong to the almighty God. And there is nothing that can come upon you except what he chooses to let to grow you, to build you, to strengthen you so that you will be as pure gold. So that you can be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Things rough in your life, accept the challenge. Fight the battle. Get on your knees and fight the battle in the, in the realm that it's supposed to be fought. Okay? Because that person that's coming against you, he's not the enemy. That event that's going on in your life, that's not the enemy. The enemy, the one that we struggle with, is spiritual. And that's where our fight is. Take the fight to the spiritual level. Get on your knees and pray. Intervene on behalf of the people before God. And see if God won't intervene on your behalf. Amen? Amen. All right, that was just a little side note. So, faithfulness. I've got a couple scriptures here that uh, I want to show you in relation to the faithfulness of God. Remember I said that this is the kind of faithfulness that Paul is equating to what we should have. Don't sweat it because it's his spirit living in us that bursts in us. Okay? I can't ever have the faith of God. You're right, he gives it to you. Okay? If it's your own faith, it's a weak, pale, puny thing. And you're in trouble. All right? Let God birth the faithfulness in you and then live in it. All right? So here, 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, he, being God, remains faithful. Now that's a cool statement right there, but I love what he follows it up with. For he cannot deny himself. Okay. Do you understand what that means? Faithful <coughs> is intrinsic to who God is. For God to not be faithful would be like me saying, this is not my arm. I just borrowed it from Dennis. It's not mine. It just kind of does its own thing. Don't blame me for the things it does. <laughs> Okay? Don't, it's, it's not. I hate when it does that. Okay? For God to not be faithful would deny who he is. It can't happen. So even when we stumble and we fall, he is faithful. That's a promise that you can cling to. 
You may not see what's going on. You may not see what's around the bend, but he does, and he is faithful. Okay? Hebrews 10.23 Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Okay? So not only is his nature faithful, but he's given us promises that he will be faithful to uphold, that he will be faithful to bring to completion, that he will be faithful to accomplish. When God gives you a promise, hold on to that more than anything because he will not leave his promises empty and unfulfilled. This is our great hope. Okay? Hebrews 11. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Now, think about that for a minute. How old was Sarah when she got pregnant? Well past childbearing age. She was older than my grandmother when my grandmother passed away. And God birthed in her a nation. Why? Because God had promised that he would. And God is faithful to deliver on his promises. Okay? God is faithful. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Here's a promise for you to cling to. Write this down. Put it somewhere you will see it all the time. Okay? Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. What does sanctify mean? Set you apart completely. Make you his own completely. Okay? And may your whole spirit and soul and body, is there any part of you that is not included in those three? No, that's everything. That's all you've got. Spirit, soul, and body. Be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. Blameless. Why? Because he's faithful. And he's going to do it. He will surely do it because he's faithful. 1 John 1. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that passage. Because it's not just out of the goodness of his heart that he forgives us. It's out of his justice that he forgives us. That same justice that required death and blood holds him to forgive us when we confess our sins. Do you understand that? God is perfect in justice and one day all the nations will be gathered before him and he will mete out justice. But for those of us that have been covered in the blood of his son who have been marked as his, sealed unto him, he is just in forgiving our sins. That's awesome. Wrap your brain around that for a while. Chew on that. Meditate on that. It is God's justice that causes him to forgive us. It was his love that put things in place to pay the price where his justice would be fulfilled. But now that that price has been paid, he is just to forgive us. So this is the nature of God, and this is what Paul is telling us we should look like. So I just kind of tossing and turning last night. I don't know about you guys, but I went to bed really early. I fell asleep about five <laughs> this morning. Okay, actually it was a little after five. There was a lot of 
struggle last night. There was a, a lot of conflict in my brain. There was a lot of spiritual garbage that was going on. There were a lot of people that I was praying for and interceding for. There were a lot of struggles that I was dealing with personally. But in the course of all of this, I felt like God was prompting me. Okay? Where do we take this? How does this play out in our lives? And so this morning I got up and I started looking. Uh, and I'll tell you what, getting up after only two hours of sleep stinks. It was actually a little bit more than two hours because I overslept. And Christy had to wake me up. <coughs> what does faithfulness look like in our lives? What are we faithful to? Well, the, the obvious answer should be Big G, not Glenn. <laughs> Big G, bigger G, biggest G, God. Thank you. Okay, biggest G, God. Our faithfulness should be to him first. But how is that played out? What does that look like? That's a nice thing to say. Yeah, we're faithful to God. What does that mean? How does that look in our lives? Well, how often do you communicate with him? I, I, at least three, four times a day, every time before I eat. <laughs> I don't know how lucky Paul was. When he ate, went through the body and passed out. Mine just sits right here. <laughs> okay? But if that's the only time you pray, then that, that's a good time to pray. Scripture indicates that we should pray the blessing over our food. Okay, that, that's fine. But if that's all the communication you have with God, you don't have a God, you have a cook. <laughs> or maybe a grocer. Okay? How often are you praying? Well, what does Scripture have to say about praying? Ooh, ouch. Thank you. Romans 12.12, 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Be constant in prayer. 2 Corinthians 1.11, you also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us through the prayers of many. So it's not just communication with God, which is a good thing. You want to have communication with God. But there's also intercession. Where you are praying for others. Where you are lifting up the needs and concerns for others. 1 Timothy 2.1 First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Okay? Okay? You don't have enough to pray about? Just fixate on all people. Grab a phone book. <laughs> Start with the church roster. Start with the church roster. When you've worked your way through the church roster, start with all your friends. Start with your family. Start with people that are connected to you some way. Start with your coworkers. You don't have enough to pray about? Call me. I'll give you lots. Okay? Seriously, if you don't have enough to pray about, you're blind. Or you're looking inside. You're, you're not looking out. Okay? So pray. Having communication unceasingly with the Almighty. How about worship? Do you ever think about that? Worship? John chapter 4, Jesus is talking with the Samaritan woman, which is an incredible story in and of itself. One, taboo that he's talking to a woman. Two, she's a Samaritan woman. And Jesus approaches her. He says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. 
For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. God is looking to and fro throughout the earth for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, that doesn't mean that you've got to clean up your act before you come to worship. That's not truth. You come with all the good and all the bad. Because he already sees it. He already knows it. And you give it to him. And let him refine you. And get rid of the bad. And you'd be amazed how much you think is good, he's actually going to get rid of. Because it's based in your pride. Okay? Be a true worshiper. Don't be intimidated by people around you. Who cares what they think? They're not the judge. There's only one judge. And he's the one you want to impress. <clears throat> because I'll tell you, I missed it in worship today. I blew it. Because... On that song, Almighty, I knew I was supposed to kneel down before the throne of God and worship Him. And I wouldn't. And I missed it. That's the bad part that I bring to Him and He fixes. Okay? Fix your hearts on the one true God because He's worthy of worship. Worship. So prayer, worship. Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You know what? That, that, those two words don't really go together. Living sacrifice. Do you understand that? Because what's a sacrifice? Something you kill. It gives its life up. That is our life. That's why Jesus said that we are to take up our cross and follow him. Okay? That leads me to another point. Self-denial. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay? This, this is a heavy statement right here. And this is something we really have got to grasp. When you come to Christ, the only way you come to Christ is through the cross. Okay? That's, that's the only way to it. His grace is there at the cross. You can't get it any other way. When you come to Him, you give up your rights to your life, which you really don't have anyway because you're already serving a different master. You're already a slave to sin. So you have no control over your life that you think you had anyway. It's a deception. That's another lie that the father of lies has given us, is that we have some kind of control over our life. You have no control. Try not sinning. Try it. Without God, it's impossible. Okay? So when we come to him, we come through the cross, and he births in us a new life that is his. And it's his to do with as he chooses. Like the prophet said, what does the pot get to ask of the potter? What would you make of me? You don't get that choice. If God wants you to be a spittoon, 
Be the best platoon you can be. And you will bring glory to the Father. Because it's not about you. It's about Him. But maybe He wants to make of you a base for holding flowers, roses. Something beautiful. Something for noble purposes. Let Him have control. Because you're going to find the most satisfaction in life when you meet what He is asking of you. Now, I didn't say you're going to have it the easiest in life. Sometimes it's going to be very, very hard. But choose that. Okay? So, we give up our life unto Him, but there's something else He gives us. Romans 15.2 says, Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Did you get what that means? We're supposed to follow Christ. He is our model. He chose not to put himself forward, but to put others above himself. That's what we're to do. We are to prefer one another above ourselves. What does that mean? You've got to work that out. But I'll tell you this. It's not going to be rationing your time. You know what? In God, there is no me time. I need a little me time. No. You, you read the Gospels and look at what me time was for Christ. What was me time? Me time was getting up before everybody else and getting along with the Father that he would be refreshed and re-energized and recharged for what? To feel good about himself? He knew who he was. What's not to feel good about? It was so that he could go and serve and be about the work of his Father. And that's where we're supposed to be at. You want me time? Get along with God. Let him recharge you. Let him rebuild you and refresh you. I'm not saying don't do hobbies. That's, that's not what I'm saying. Dennis, you still go fishing. <laughs> Youth group fishing trip is still on. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we have this mentality that it's about me. And if that's your mentality, then you really aren't living unto him. You're really living unto yourself. And you're rationing out that part of you that you'll give him. This far and no further. Okay? So, we look out to the needs of others as well. What about uh, this? I want to show you something. These right here are absolutely fantastic. But this is not and will never be this. Okay? This right here, absolutely fantastic. I'm going to talk about these in a little bit. But this should never and can never take the place of this. Romans 15.4 says, For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the, the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Do you understand that? That's what this is for, to give us hope. This is to encourage us. Okay? This is his story about our failure and his success which then becomes our success. But this was put into place that we might have hope. Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. You got to know this to be able to do those things. Okay? And you realize we're all called to do those things. 
because we are a body. We are mutually accountable one to another. Which brings me to another point. Fellowship. Being knitted together into the body of Christ. Not this. This. Because there's not two bodies touching. There is one body. One. And if you are in Christ, God has designed it and required that we be knitted into that body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Read it. Take a look at it. One part cannot say to another part, I have no need of you. That's not saying I have no need of God. It's saying I have no need of the church, his body, of which Christ is the head. And if Christ is the head and he has said we have got to join together, how dare we rationalize and excuse not being joined together? That would be like my ear telling my eyeball, I don't need you. I don't need to head. I'm going to go off and do my own thing. And off goes my ear. <clears throat> Thanks be to God, we already have a living example of Jesus being able to put that ear back on and healing it back in place, right? <clears throat> but God is adamant throughout the New Testament that you cannot do this thing on your own. He has not called you to do it on your own. He has called you to be knitted in and be part of the body of Christ. Fellowship. 1 John 1, 6 and 7. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. You see that we have fellowship with one another. You get that? Now, don't get me wrong. The way we do church today is not really how they set it up in the New Testament. We don't know how an actual church service worked in the New Testament church. We know how it started off in the synagogue, and we can kind of look at that, but, but we don't know when, when they actually got away from that. and, and We don't know what they... We, I don't know what songs they sing. I don't know how many songs they sing. I don't know the order. I don't know. We have no clue. Okay? But this is what we've got. This. All right? And if there are things that we are doing wrong according to the word, then we got to fix them. Not bail. You don't have that option. See, he doesn't tell you you don't like it. Go home. That's not an option. <clears throat> when I'm talking about us, I'm not talking about Jesus Community Church. I'm talking about the church universal. Okay? I don't think this is the end-all, be-all of churches. I think it's one of the best. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'm biased. Mm -hmm. But I think God has done an incredible thing in putting this body of believers, this family together. But you know what? God is in churches all around the globe. And if you can't be here, be in one of them and be knitted in. Be knitted in so that you can't be pulled out. Amen? Amen. Faithfulness. Showed you how God is faithful to us, that Paul is calling us to that same kind of faithfulness unto God, unto each other. It's not something we can play with. It's something that we're directed to do. And if the Spirit is living inside of us, we should be moving toward that. We should be growing in that. We should be maturing in that. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, Father, for your word, for your example. Father, you have put nothing on us that you are not already. 
that Father, your Son, did not have in his life here on this earth, suffering all the temptations that we did, going through the struggles that we go through, and yet he exhibited all of this fruit in his life. And Father, not only that, but you're not asking us to do it of ourselves. You've given us your spirit to grow these things in us. You've given us the helper. Help us, Father, to get out of the way that these things might grow, that they might be abundant in our life, that they might be readily evident and apparent to everyone around us, Father, not just our brothers and sisters, but those people in the world, that they would be able to say, wow, I see these things growing in you. We bless you, Father, because you've not required of us anything that you don't give us. Help us, Father, to take up our cross and follow you. To put aside everything that we think and accept what you know. And be the people that bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name.